you know, again, these setbacks. And uh, so easy to get uh, discouraged, certainly in our life and our journey spiritually. And we've been seeing that with, uh, with Abraham. And, and uh, <clears throat> he'd kind of bum us out when he'd do these really dumb things about lying about his wife's identity. And, uh, uh, you know, the first time it's like, okay, you're an idiot, but we'll forgive you. And we're all ready to, I'm ready to kill him the second time he does it after years of God's faithfulness. Because we're not like that, of course. We're just like steady Eddie, always trusting the Lord, never doubting. But uh, for these guys in the Bible, I don't know what's up with them, but uh, Abraham, you know, but God doesn't give up. We started out saying it was a journey of faith in chapter 12. It really became a journey of grace by the time we get to chapter 25 and hear the burial of, uh, of Abraham. Now, Moses, again, writing uh, uh, sandwiches in between or bookends, uh, two genealogies, one of... Uh, his marriage to Keturah, after he's a widower for a period of time, we'll find that Abraham marries again and has uh, more sons. Uh, then we have his burial, and then again the other book in then is it recaps Ishmael in his life and his descendants as well, because the promise to Abraham is that I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the heavens, as the sand on the sea. Uh, the idea that you can't count them. Uh, and not that Abraham saw all of that in his life, but he saw quite a bit. I mean, this guy had a, a number of sons and grandsons and that nations would actually come from him. And we'll talk about what those, uh, who they are, who those nations are uh, this morning as we get into those genealogies. Uh, this is a, a transitional text, as I said, from chapters 1 to 11. In Genesis, you've got creation, fall, the flood, and the tower of, of Babel. From 12, you've got the call of Abraham. And then everything deals to, to chapter 50 on four, four people or personalities, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. And this is the transition for now from Abraham, who's dominated for a large portion uh, of the book, and, uh, and then continues with Isaac, Rebecca, and we get introduced to Jacob and Esau in this chapter as well. Let's take a look at the first six verses where uh, the point here is that Isaac will retain all the rights to the promise despite uh, the number of other children that Abraham has. <clears throat> Verse 1, Abraham took a wife, and her name was Keturah, and she bore him a Zimram, Jokshan, Midan, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. Uh, Jokshan begot Sheba and Dedan. Now we're going to mention who they are and the nation that comes through them later. And the sons of Dedan were... Uh, Ashurim, Lechurim, Le, uh, Leumim, and the sons of Midian were Ephar, Ephur, Hanak, Abedah, and Alda. And these were the children of Keturah. And Abraham gave all that he had to Isaac, but Abraham gave gifts to the sons of the concubines, which Abraham had. And just, you know, because that throws people off concubines, plural, who is that speaking about? That's Hagar, uh, and that is uh, Keturah, his wives. It's uh, uh, sometimes we think of somebody have it like uh, like uh, Solomon, who ends up having 300 concubines. Who obviously, uh, I don't know that he was married to them. But he only, given the fact that he already had 700 wives, uh, big mistake. But uh, uh, that's not the connotation here. Anyway, sometimes that needs a little explanation. People come up later and go, "Who was that?" Well, it was the two gals that he was married to that we already are aware of, and we're going to get their genealogies, which Abram had. And while he was still living, he sent them eastward, okay, the, uh, these grown, grown sons that he has, away from Isaac, his son, to the country of the east. So first we'd say uh, in the negative, Abram's children with Gertur are, are mentioned but would not retain covenant promises. Notice he sends them away as they get older, they get gifts. He pretty much is making sure he, he separates them uh, from his son, uh, Isaac, and, and again, there is a time gap. He does uh, marry again. We can kind of do some of the math and figure that he was married to Keturah before he died for about 35 to, to 38 years. Uh, there are six sons that are mentioned, plus the 12 sons from uh, Ishmael uh, that, uh, again, their descendants occupy not all, uh, but portions of the Middle East uh, today. But he makes a very important distinction Moses is making sure that we get this, uh, that the six new sons uh, are not going to somehow inherit the covenant promises that Isaac, Isaac the promised child, Isaac his physical descendant, 
through which the Abrahamic covenant would be uh, passed on. That is the promise that the land uh, would be given, the Messiah would come through him, all the nations of the earth would be blessed through him. That all continues through Isaac, which is to say the obvious sin. Secondly, it is only <coughs> Isaac who will retain the covenant uh, uh, promises. And uh, uh, as we get a little further on uh, in our text, we're going to read, and, and God blessed Isaac, and that becomes the theme of about the next 10, uh, 10 chapters. Verse 11, we're going to see that he remains living in the area of Be'er Lahai Roy, uh, which is where he is when, uh, remember, when the servant comes with Rebecca, she's riding along on the camels. She sees he's out in the evening uh, meditating on, on the Lord and, uh, and so forth, and he sees the camels coming, knows that uh, that, uh, that is potentially his bride, and, and then he begins slow motion, remember, moving in that direction, and uh, she says, who is the young man coming? And uh, well, that's your husband to be. So she very appropriately, uh, in modest fashion, gets off of the camel at that point, puts on her wedding veil, so he'll know who she is. Uh, and of course, they they meet. They go into <clears throat> what was Sarah's tent, which would become her home, and uh, and they marry. And then the text says, and he loved her. And uh, so we have this uh, whole story of uh, how they met. It all takes place and. I think it's significant that he, you know, he could have lived a lot of places. He's not living, you know, where Abraham is living at this time, but he's in a place where he heard from God and uh, where God ministered to him. And, and he's going to stay in, in that place uh, here as he uh, continues to grow. But uh, no, no confusion when it comes to the promise. Isaac will retain the promise. Secondly, uh, Abraham's life is remembered uh, in his death in verse 7 to 11. This is the sum of the years of Abraham's life which he lived. 175 years, and Abraham breathed his last, last and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years, and was gathered to his people. And his sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave at Machpelah, which is before Mamre in the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar the Hittite. The field which Abraham purchased from the sons of Heth, there Abraham was buried, and Sarah his wife. And it came to pass, after the death of Abraham, that God, there it is, blessed his son Isaac, <coughs> and Isaac dwelt at Be'er Lahai Roy. So the first thing we want to mention about this is that Abraham's life is remembered in three key phrases. And just, you know, as a side note, if you were to, uh, to do the math, you could find out, as we'll go on and read, about the birth of, uh, of Jacob and Esau that they are about 15 years old at the time of, uh, of Abraham's death. So uh, they, they would have grown up, you know, around Abraham. Uh, pretty cool grandfather. A couple good stories to share. <laughs> Leaving Ur of the Chaldeans uh, and so forth. And uh, his journey of faith and God's faithfulness and God's grace and so forth. And uh, tremendous spiritual heritage that uh, both of these uh, kids uh, would, have, would have had. In this description of his remembrance, uh, the phrase is used, Abraham died at a good old age. At 175, I would say so. I'm not sure what a good old age is these days. Uh, I just hope I'm not approaching it soon. But uh, these guys walked with the Lord for 100 years and, uh, at, this, at this point. Uh, back in uh, verse 4 of chapter 12, he's referred to as a friend of God. Uh, and again, the thing we remember uh, like the video clip, he failed many times, but he always would come back to the Lord and admit that failure, where he had gone wrong and how he had departed in his faith and his trust from God, and he would call on the name of the Lord again, and we see his relationship restored. This chapter is going to end with his grandson who refused to do that, and uh, there's quite a, a contrast between, between these two men in this chapter. Uh, part of what we see here, again, is this idea of faithfully walking for, with God for many decades uh, makes a huge difference then as he grows, grows older or not. Uh, I know that if I had not come to faith in Jesus Christ, uh, I would just grow old and bitter and cynical. You know, things aren't looking too good out there in the world today. It would be very easy just to fall into a, being a very negative, very cynical person and uh, I, uh, you know, I meet somebody like that once in a while, 
and uh, has got a few years uh, on me and stuff. And man, I just, yeah, I pray that I, that I would not become that, you know, in, in the future, that, um, that it would be possible to continue to grow uh, in God's grace. And, uh, and certainly there's a, there's a lot of, of uh, those that are uh, a few years advanced uh, than me that have, uh, uh, would claim that that's possible. Uh, the uh, Russian author Al Alexander Solzhenitsky, uh, in one of his books, uh, wrote the following. You're, you're going to appreciate this, Mark. Aging is in no sense a punishment from on high. You, you may have, Mark's had a few surgeries, so it's inside joke here. But, but uh, brings its own blessing and a warmth of color all its own. There's a warmth to be drawn from the waning of your own strength. You are still in this life, yet you're rising above the material plane. Growing old serenely is not a downhill path, but it's an ascent. And uh, it's nice to be around people that are growing old that really live that. Yeah, they might have a few more aches and pains than somebody else, uh, but there's something of their life that there's actually still an enjoyment in growing older and uh, growing older uh, in the Lord. Uh, and I think that was the life of Abraham. Secondly, he is, uh, he is described as an old man full of years, full of years in his expression that indicates two things. One, that life is limited. Uh, it's full, and then, and then it's done. Then, then it's over. And it doesn't just continue on and on. And we're certainly exhorted in the Psalms in particular to, uh, Lord, help me number my days that I measure them aright, that I understand that I've got a limited time here on, uh, on planet Earth to do whatever it is I'm going to do in terms of, uh, in my case, a dad and a father and a grandfather and as a pastor and a minister and so forth. I've just got a limited time. We all have a limited time to what we can do for God and for God's kingdom. Uh, and, uh, and it's so important that we try to live our lives without regrets. I'm sure we've all, we've all got them, but uh, to try to uh, minimize them. Psalm 139, verse 16 uh, says, Psalm says, Your eyes saw my substance, uh, being yet unformed. You saw my body before it was even formed. And in your book, they were all written. What was written? The days fashioned for me, when as yet none of the, uh, there were none of them. Before I even came into being, before you did, God already knew the date of your birth, the date of your death, uh, everything uh, in, uh, in between. Uh, and, uh, and Abraham's days were, were a finite set, just as uh, all of ours. Nobody's going to die early. No one's going to show up in heaven. And God's going to go, what are you doing here? You're not scheduled to be here for like six more years. How did this? See, that's not, that's not going to happen uh, with, uh, with anyone. Uh, spiritual wisdom demands that we number our days. Psalm 39, verse 4, Lord, make me to know my end. What is the measure of my life that I may know how frail I am? And, and really, it's true. You have a tendency when you're younger to think that, you don't think about those things. You just assume that you're going to live forever. So therefore, you have a little more risky behavior and things because you're invincible. <laughs> it was interesting the, uh, a number of years ago, and I remember because uh, our kids were little. There was a, uh, like a circus at the Blaisdell Center. You're going to show your age if you remember. There was a circus at the Blaisdell Center, and there was an elephant that was, went crazy, went berserk, and, and killed the trainer. And, uh, and it was packed with uh, school kids. It was like an afternoon matinee, you know, bring all the kids down from all the schools, kind of a, uh, do a, a cheaper show for them and stuff. So you had all of these uh, kids in there. And, of course, they've just witnessed a guy being killed right before their very eyes, stomped to death by this elephant. And then, you know, he runs, the elephant runs out, chases blocks down the street in Honolulu, and, and uh, they finally uh, corner him and uh, dispose of the, uh, the elephant when they got somebody with a big enough gun, which uh, took a while to get somebody like that there. Uh, they've had all these follow-up counselors with the kids, very concerned about these kids that are four, five, six, seven, eight, nine years old. They were okay. <laughs> they were okay. Because after all, they have trouble separating reality from what they view on television, by the way. So they're used to seeing death and killing all the time because it happens on TV. It was just another, just like a cartoon character being killed. Really didn't affect too many younger kids. Who got their world rocked were all the high school guys and gals that saw it. Because as far as they know, they're going to live forever. They're invincible. Those are the guys and gals that needed lots of counseling and help and follow-up and so forth. Uh, very interesting. The psalmist is saying the sooner that we get this thing figured out, that life ends, that it's a finite period of time, 
uh, the, the wiser we're going to be spiritually. Abraham fully, fully understood that. He also died, again, full of years, meaning not just a limited time, but uh, and I think in his case, and hopefully ours, a quality of time as well. One writer said, some people, when they look back, it's with regret. When they look ahead, it's with fear. And when they look around, it's with complaint. And that's not who we want to be. And I don't think that was the life of Abraham. There was a quality to his life because he's a guy that, remember, he's wealthy, but he, he owns nothing. I mean, God had blessed him totally, but none of it meant anything to him. The only thing the guy ever bought, he lived in a tent. The only thing the guy ever bought was a, a burial place for, for his, himself and his wife. So like everything else in life, to be successful in old age, I think you've got to start working at it in young age. It's, it's a lot about your relationship with the Lord, perspective, and how you spend your time and your priorities. Thirdly, Abraham was gathered to his people. <laughs> well, it's only Sarah. So uh, this is not a reference uh, to the idea of being buried with her. It's beyond that. It's speaking of eternal things. His people, who are those? Well, that goes all the way back to uh, Adam and Noah and everybody else in between, in between that died uh, in righteousness, waiting for the Messiah to come and die for their sins. Jesus tells the story about this, not a parable, because he uses names, personal names, in Luke 16, a place that actually gets called and referred to as Abraham's bosom, where Abraham is, Jesus says, before he died on the cross, where he is in a place of comfort. And he talks about a man that died and went there. And yet there was a rich man over here, a gulf in between, and on this side, a place of torment. He was crying across, saying, can you send Lazarus back to tell my brothers that this place exists? So they'll be spared from this. And, uh, and Jesus said, of course, at the end, even if someone do died and rose again, they still would not, would not believe if they don't believe the word of God. And, uh, but he talks about Abraham's bosom. That's where Abraham is going to, a place of comfort where he would await for Jesus Christ to die, the Messiah to die for our sins, rise again, so that Jesus could then take these to heaven with him. Those that die apart from Christ, without faith, without the righteousness of Jesus Christ, go to this place called Hades or Sheol, a place of torment where they wait for the white throne judgment. Uh, being there, that's not hell. They're not there yet. It's just a place of torment to be held. In the same way, if someone's convicted uh, in a crime, they're taken in, they stand trial, and the judge says guilty. And that's the reason they're there. And they're taken to a temporary holding facility and brought back later for sentencing. That's what the white throne judgment is. But Abraham is gathered to his people. It's not just talking about putting his body in the tomb at Machpelah. It's talking about the eternal life he has with those that also had died in faith in the Messiah and those that would continue to until the Messiah came for them because only the death in his blood can completely forgive us of our sins. Uh, secondly, Abraham's remembered not just by these three phrases, but it's interesting uh, by Isaac and Ishmael. So Ishmael shows up. He's kind of been off the scene for a, a number of years. And it's interesting that, you know, again, the half-brother and these guys haven't seen each other since he was probably 15 years old. And I don't know how much time has uh, transpired. But, uh, but what it indicates to us is uh, Ishmael is under no delusion that the promise somehow is coming to him. It's to Isaac. Uh, that's Sarah in that tomb that her bones, when they place Abraham in there, that's not Hagar, that's not his mom in there. That is Sarah, and that is Abraham that's in there. He was fully aware that of the promises and who they were going to and who they belonged to. You know, we just wish that uh, the people that are living in this area in the West Bank today would kind of get this figured out because they've built a mosque there around the cave of uh, Machpelah where the burial is of Abraham and Sarah, pretty sure they're both Jewish. I'm just, just shot, I'm pretty sure. And then you've got Isaac and Rebekah. I'm pretty sure neither of them, of them are Muslim. Uh, and then you've got their descendants, Jacob and Leah. But we got this uh, Islamic mosque built right there and creates uh, a lot of problems for Jews and Christians that cannot really go there. There's also a synagogue built uh, right next door on the other end of the of the field. So uh, 
Ishmael, they may have a, not have a hard time figuring it out today, but uh, Ishmael was uh, under no delusion that his mother, Hagar, was not in that tomb and not buried there. This is a, a place, but for, again, those that would inherit the land, the physical descendants of Abraham, uh, and it's interesting that he comes back with his brother for the burial of his father. But uh, Isaac would retain all the promises, even though there were other children born. Abraham's life is remembered I think wonderfully uh, in his death is, uh, uh, again, with a tremendous spiritual legacy that he's able to pass on to his uh, children and grandchildren. And Ishmael's descendants will receive their promise. We see that in verse 12 to 18. This is the genealogy of Ishmael, Abraham's son, whom Hagar, the Egyptian, Sarah's uh, maidservant, bore to Abraham. And these are the names of the sons of Ishmael by their names according to their generation. And, uh, and there's a lot of them. And then in verse 16, it says, I think I'm going to save myself here. These are the sons of Ishmael. These were their names by their towns and their settlements, 12 princes according to their nations. These were the years of the life of Ishmael, 137 years, and he breathed his last and died, was gathered to his people. They dwelt from Havilah as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt. As you go towards Assyria, he died in the presence of all of his brethren. And um, again, all of this is all about that God keeps his word, God keeps his promises. And uh, we see that Ishmael's sons did receive the promise. Again, what was the promise? In Genesis 17, 17 20, <coughs> Ishmael, Ishmael and Hagar are leaving. They're basically getting, getting kicked out of Abraham's uh, tribe and camp. Uh, she is distraught because she uh, thinks they've run out of water. God intervenes and speaks to them and says, don't worry, I'm going to take care of you, and then I'm going to bless your son in this way. Verse 17, and as for Ishmael, I have heard you, behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. He shall beget 12 princes, and I will make him a great nation, but my covenant I will establish with Isaac. So again, very clear, the promise goes to Isaac, and then again through his physical descendants, which will be uh, named as we get to the birth of his two sons. The point is, God said that he would have 12 sons. How many did he have? 12. We've got a problem if he has 13 or 14. We've got a problem if he's only got 16 or 17. But he has 12 exactly the way God uh, said that he would. Uh, these, again, these descendants become the Arab people. Uh, a lot of times we hear about the Arab-Israeli conflict in the Middle East. Uh, and we mentioned before that uh, not that many Arabs actually in the Middle East. So uh, who are the Arabs and where does the conflict come from? Where do the descendants of Ishmael actually live? Because we've got their names mentioned here. Well, uh, Iraq, certainly the people of Iraq are not Arab. Uh, although one of them claimed to be uh, for a time. They are descendants of the uh, ancient Assyrians. Uh, Iran, is uh, they're not uh, Arab either. Uh, again, they are from the ancient Persian Empire. Saudi Arabia, well, they got the name Arab right in it. They must be. No, remember I mentioned Sheba and Dedan, uh, descendants of Abraham and Keturah, not Ishmael. Those are the Saudi Arabians. So they're not Arab either. Egyptians are the descendants of Ham. Remember the three sons of Noah coming off the ark, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So they're the descendants of Ham. Syria certainly is not a descendant of Ishmael. So who are the, the Arabs? Well, they're very interesting. It plays a little part in our own little recent military history. The initial Persian Gulf invasion, the Persian Gulf War, who did we rush in to save? The Arabs, the Kuwaitis. Those are the descendants of Ishmael. Those are actually the Arabs. There's a few Arabs uh, in present-day Israel that are citizen, citizens of uh, the nation of Israel and so forth, but primarily the, uh, the Arabs are the Kuwaitis. And uh, very interesting because the way in which Saddam Hussein justified his invasion of Kuwait was this, right? Because what ties all of these groups of people together is not who they were descended from. They're not Arab, except for just a few. It's, it's Islam. Islam is what ties them all together. So how does Saddam Hussein justify his invasion of another Muslim country? Well, he claims to be Arab. Why would he do that? Because Muhammad is Arab, right? So he claims to be uh, Arab, which he's not. 
but he claimed that so that then when he invades Kuwait, he said, I'm trying to retake my homeland <laughs> that's been stolen from me. We didn't get this in the Western media, but that's, that was his justification to keep other Muslim nations from, from not jumping, jumping in. And of course, it was, uh, uh, I don't know if you remember, I've uh, been around here doing this uh, long enough. We had uh, Marines in our own church that were the first guys on, on the ground. It was really a, a very uh, desperate situation because he had taken Kuwait, uh, took over all of their, their oil supplies at that point, and amassed his troops at the border of Saudi Arabia. Why does he want to go after them? They're not Arab. So he, and uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of these groups in the Middle East that do not like the Saudi Arabians because they're not actually Arab and many of them still claim it and so forth. He amasses his troops when the Marines from this base hit the ground, boots on the ground, they were outnumbered like 20 to one or something. Many of them that went that we were praying for considered it a suicide mission. They were just to get there and try to hold long enough and uh, I think just in terms of God's sovereignty and the prayers of God's people, for whatever reason, Saddam Hussein did not just move across the border and start taking Saudi Arabia, which he could have done. He held on, he, he uh, delayed, 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 and by then, over a period of the next four to six weeks, it was amazing the amount of troops that uh, we were able to get on the ground, eventually then go in and retake Saudi Arabia and drive him uh, back uh, into Iraq once again. But uh, he claimed to be Arab, but he's, uh, he's not uh, in Arab. Uh, again, one other uh, place we haven't mentioned is present-day Jordan. Uh, Jordan is the descendants of Esau, Jacob's brother, that we're going to uh, meet uh, in a moment. The point is Abraham descendants are physical descendants from Isaac, or the Jewish people in Israel, uh, through his uh, other grandson Esau. They are the people that live in Jordan. Uh, and through his other son with Hagar, Ishmael, they are the people of Kuwait. Uh, there's just, again, a portion of Arabs that are actually Arab, but when we talk about, and the news talks about the Arab-Israeli conflict, they're really, it's really a Islamic Judeo-Christian conflict. Because according to them, Israel is the little Satan, we in the US are the big Satan. And so you get this funny talk all the time about Israel is the problem. And if Israel would just do this and do this, we wouldn't be fighting this war of terror. I'm sorry, they don't really understand what the conflict is really all about when they uh, generate these, uh, uh, these ideas. Just send these politicians to me and I'll just straighten them out, give them some CDs and we'll get this thing straightened out. But uh, it's amazing how uh, clear it becomes when you actually look at the facts. But did God keep his promise to uh, Hagar? Uh, yes, he did. I will bless your son, Ishmael, from him, 12 princes will come. I will make nations out of him. God kept his word. Isaac retains the rights of the covenant promise. Abraham's remembered in his death. Ishmael will receive, did receive, the promises given to him. Let's look at Isaac, and he refuses to acknowledge this uh, very interesting prophecy concerning his two sons in verse 19 to 28. This is the genealogy of Isaac. Abraham's son. Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah as, uh, as wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Padan Aram, the sister of Laban, the Syrian. Now Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his plea and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. But the children struggled together within her and she said, has there ever been a pregnant woman to say this? If all is well with me, why am I like this? So she went to inquire of the Lord. The Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. Two people shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. So when her days were fulfilled for her to give birth, indeed, there were twins in her womb. And the first came out red. Uh, he was like a hairy garment all over. So they called him Esau. Afterwards, his brother came out, and his hand took hold of Esau's heel, so his name was called Jacob, or Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she, was, uh, when she bore them, so the boys grew, and Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, but Jacob was a mild man dwelling in tents, and Isaac loved Esau because he ate his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. 
first thing to note about this is, uh, you know, you go through it all very quickly, but, um, you know, Isaac, you know, you have the whole story. He meets Rebecca. She comes and the, all the, the faithfulness of God, you know, if you're here for that story of the servant going <coughs> back to this area where uh, Abraham was from, and he kind of puts this thing out, I'm going to go here, you know, I'm going to go by the well, and if a gal comes out, and she'll spend the next four hours <laughs> watering my camels, I'll know she's the one, and you know, this whole thing, and, uh, and you can just totally see God's uh, sovereignty, his providence guiding this guy to get to uh, Rebecca, to say, she's, she is the, the one, she is the one, and uh, in the story, and he sees her, and he loves her, and and now they're married, and uh, they are going to have the promised child. They're going to have a son, right? The covenant promises are through them. One year, two years, three years, five years, ten years. And she doesn't get pregnant. She's not getting pregnant. And he's praying for 20 years, uh, which says a lot about uh, uh, the idea of persevering in prayer and how important it is. You just, you know, there's probably a lot of you that have prayed for a family member for, for 20 years or, or more. I know there's some of you here that we've had the privilege of seeing your mom or your dad except, except Jesus Christ days, weeks, or hours before they went to be with him after decades of prayer. And uh, a lot of you have those, uh, those stories and those testimonies. And it's encouraging that, you know, because you can say, hey, don't, don't give up. And that's what Jesus says in Matthew 18. One, it says he spoke a parable to them, the disciples, the men always ought to pray and not lose heart. But uh, again, NIV says, don't give up. That's the idea. And then he goes on and tells the parable. The parable is, he refers to this guy as the unjust judge. So uh, the unjust judge uh, refuses to hear a woman's case and her cry for mercy, whatever her, her situation is. Uh, but it says, Jesus says that, but because of her persistence and that she just kept coming and coming and coming, he finally says, she's going to drive me crazy. Okay, let's hear the case. And, and she's able to uh, get justice. And this is what Jesus says about that then in verse 6. Then the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge said. And shall, uh, shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? So when Jesus returns, he says, will he find people that are willing to persevere in prayer no matter what? And, uh, and that's what Isaac did. Pray for, pray for 20 years. I mean, that's, that's a long time. He's 60. You know, it's like he's got, <laughs> he's got the story of, uh, of his father uh, and his mother, probably in the back of his mind, though, it's like, well, God said they would have a child, and I'm not, I'm not going to do the, the Hagar thing, that's for sure. I'm just going to keep praying. If God was faithful to them, he'll be faithful to me. Sometimes it's good to hear those stories from others, from us. Sometimes it's good to read the biographies of uh, other Christians and say, man, God, you're so, so faithful. It can help us persevere in prayer. Uh, the prophecy about this uh, birth of the sons is interesting. Note that it's given not to Isaac, it's given to Rebekah. But the children struggled within her, verse 22, and she said, If all is well, why am I like this? <laughs> so she uh, went to inquire the Lord. I'm sure my daughter Melissa is probably saying that occasionally during the weeks of her, her pregnancy. If everything's okay, how can I feel like this? <laughs> and go through what I'm going through and the hormones going on and the sickness and, and all these things. But uh, what does she do? Well, she got the latest book that had just been published on how to correct your life in 10 easy steps. No, she actually, uh, she sought the Lord. That's what it says. She inquired of the Lord. She went to the Lord and said, hey, this is going on. But I feel like I got two kids in me and they're duking it out like every day. I haven't slept in three weeks. What in the world? If I'm okay, what's going on? Isn't it good just to know you're okay? It's, uh, you know, it's uh, always reassuring, you know, when you go to the doctor and he says, well, you have this, we're going to do this, and in 90 days, you'll be okay. Okay. It's always not good when he goes, well, we don't really know. We're going to run a series of tests. <laughs> it's good to know. And the Lord tells her what's going on. It's the two kids uh, within you. Uh, and he gives this prophecy. Two nations are in your womb. Two people shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. And she believes it, and Isaac doesn't. 
and, uh, or he refuses, or he doesn't care. Because, uh, you know, the number one son thing in the Middle East, as in Asian cultures today, is very, very important, right up until pretty much the current generation. Uh, Kathy's mom had seven brothers. When her, uh, Gigi, when her fa grandfather died, when, when her mom's dad died, uh, the number one son got everything. We were like, what's up with that? That's the culture. That's the culture here. Very important. The birthright. Who gets what? And so this prophecy is, is very different. You got two nations. You got two sons. They're kind of battling now. One's going to be stronger than the other one. Which is it? It's going to be the younger one. Huh? The younger one? Rebecca believes him. And we're going to see that in her actions. As we get to this whole thing and what we sometimes refer to as her, her deception so that Jacob gets the blessing, well, her deception is because she believes God's word. And, uh, and Isaac's not going along with it. Uh, why is he not going along with it? Hey, man, he, he uh, made a pretty good meal there. Verse 28. Uh, Isaac's favoritism proved to be his great failure as a parent, we would say. And Isaac loved Esau because he ate his game. Well, that's, that's a really uh, good reason to show favoritism over one of your kids over, over the other. I just got to mention that they both had their own cable uh, shows during this time. Uh, Esau, of course, is on the outdoor channel because he was out there hunting with uh, the bow. Not a compound bow, just a regular bow, killing wild, uh, wild game. And uh, uh, he also, uh, of course, had the, the sponsor was his own beer company, Big Red, because we'll see that he's quite, quite the drinker as, uh, as we go on. I mean, that's Esau. What is he like? He's a living beer commercial. Uh, and uh, I'll give you a little more insight to that in the New Testament uh, in a moment, what it has to say about him. But even without the New Testament, that's what Judaism says about him as, uh, as well. But uh, again, of course, Jacob... Uh, he had just won the Iron Chef, so he's going to spin off now and have his own show about uh, lentil stew. Uh, but, and that's enough to cause uh, Isaac to uh, favor one over the other. One's got the better outdoor show than the other one. Verse 28, but Rebecca, in contrast to that, the but, but Rebecca loved Jacob. It doesn't matter what Isaac is going to do what he's going to choose to do blindly, who he's going to favor. It's not going to affect her. She's going to love Jacob anyway. And God loves Jacob as well. It says so in a couple of times in Scripture. And it says in marked contrast to how he feels about uh, Isaac. Uh, it's an interesting uh, statement. Uh, and sometimes you say of Jacob, well, he's a kid only a mother could love. No, that's not it. She's, she believes God's word. Uh, he's refusing to believe or at least accept this prophecy. Well, let's go on. We'll, verse 29 to 34 and just mention a couple of things about these kids in their youth. There's some things very early on revealed about their character. Now, Jacob cooked a stew and Esau came in from the field and he was weary. And Esau said to Jacob, please feed me with that same red stew for I am weary. Therefore, his name is called uh, Edom or Adam. But Jacob said, sell me your birthright as of this day. And Esau said, look, I'm about to die. What is a birthright to me? Then uh, Jacob said, swear to me as of this day. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and stew of lentils. Then he ate and drank, arose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. So we would say, is the character of Jacob revealed in this offer to his brother? And uh, I'm as guilty as everybody else as far as uh, giving Jacob a hard time. We even say that, uh, uh, again, uh, Esau means, you know, hairy or red. You know, it's very clear in Scripture. Jacob means heel catcher. He, he, he reached up to grab his heel as, uh, as they were coming uh, uh, out, of, uh, out of the womb. That, that had, you know, be pretty interesting, but uh, that, uh, that he did that. And so heel catcher or Jacob or Jacob. But we also say that uh, usurper. It can be seen that way, and sometimes we tongue-in-cheek say Jacob means uh, dirty, sneaky thief, you know, because he really becomes, you know, quite, quite the schemer. But in this incident, and we'll follow his story, but in this incident, he is never condemned for what he does. Who is condemned is Esau. Esau could care less about the things of God. He could care less about the stories from Abraham. He could care less about the stories from, uh, from Isaac. 
the idea of covenant promises and a relationship with the Lord mean nothing to him, but they apparently mean something to Jacob. So when he comes in, Jacob simply makes the offer. It means nothing to you. It means everything to me. Will you give it to me? I'll give you something to eat. Yeah, I don't care. Swear it this day. I'll do it. I don't care. That's, this is Esau. It's the kid, his, his grandfather's Abraham. It's like, man, what a godly spiritual heritage. The stories of God's grace. It seems to have no, no effect upon him. He is known as someone who is sexually immoral and godless. And one writer said he's perhaps the saddest and most godless person in Scripture outside of Judas. Who are the worst people in Scripture? Judas, Esau. We don't think of them that way. But uh, again, he's immoral, he's godless, he has no ethics, no faith, no scruples, no reverence, totally worldly, totally secular, and totally uh, profane. Let me read to you from Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. We could read, he's mentioned a few places in Scripture, but uh, look at this one here as the writer kind of exhorts the body of Christ as believers and then uses Esau as the illustration. The exhortation, pursue peace with all people, and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. So we should be, that's what we should be doing, pursuing peace, be kind to people, uh, seek to live a holy life before them. Why? Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. We don't want anyone to miss the grace of God. What would happen if we didn't do that? Lest any root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by this many become defiled. If we're not really seeking these things, there's an indication that we can live our lives in such a way as that, as that bitterness gets into our lives, and it's like a root. It finds its way in. It defiles us, and then it begins to defile other people. Again, this is speaking of Christians in the body of Christ. And then here's the illustration, verse 16. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau. When I said that he was sexually immoral, and he would profane the things of God. That's what it's saying right there. Uh, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright? For you know that afterwards, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with, with tears. A bitter root had grown up in the heart of Esau for whatever reason, and uh, it defiled him, and it was going to defile uh, others as well. Again, probably one of the saddest people in scripture apart from Judas himself. Uh, he's a guy that, uh, again, was uh, lived, for, lived for the moment, lived for physical pleasures. Uh, he's, uh, you know, very relevant to our culture today. There's a lot of Esau's running around. As I said, the guy was a, a living beer commercial. Uh, he, he was just macho to the max. Uh, uh, and, and again, one writer said, the things that permeate your culture are the things that will destroy you and your effect, uh, the effect or effort you have to run the race of faith. And uh, what a contrast with Abraham who, you know, he would blow it, but then he would, he would realize it. Lord, forgive me. You know, I don't know what I was thinking. That was so stupid, Lord, and, you know, have mercy on me. And God would forgive him and God would restore him. And here's a guy that's so cynical and so bitter in his own heart that he would just never go there and, and never do it. The godly heritage, but uh, uh, the exhortation here is Esau made a very bad decision. Instead of repenting, he just became bitter. And the writer says, don't let that happen to you. Make sure no one misses the grace of God. It's a long journey from chapter 12 to 25. Uh, Abraham dies full of years and gathered to his people. Uh, it's God's grace uh, that did that, and they learned to trust the promises of God. Well, let's pray.